Hey guys, welcome back, it's Ripe again in today's video. A terrible neighbor hates the noise my car makes and especially when I do so on Sundays. She ends up blowing out my tires with a shotgun. Here is what happened, let's dive right into the story. So the first one starts like this. I remember when I was a kid and I watched the original The Fast and the Furious movie and I instantly fell in love with car modding. As I grew up, I dreamed of owning my own little sporty car and spending all my money fixing it up. When I finally passed my driving test and got my first vehicle, it was a banked up piece of poop, but I loved it and I felt like Toretto. Little by little, I got money to buy simple parts that would mostly make my car sound sporty more than anything. This is because trying to get parts in Mexico is next to impossible, if not incredibly expensive. The car culture in Mexico is a lot different than in the States or Europe. No one looks after their cars and they are all rusty, dented, stinking wrecks. The only place you could call a modding scene is amongst the taxi drivers and if they spot you hooning around in a modded car, they get a little aggressive to the point where they actually set my mate's car on fire because he thought he could make some extra cash as an Uber. This attitude towards cars has a deep impact on those wanting to get into the modding scene. You have to take cars to the dealership because garages here in Mexico generally don't do a great job or even have a clean job because they are used to having to deal with uncaring drivers and getting a white arch kit fitted at a dealership gets very expensive. That is of course if you can find one that will do the work for you. Then there are the clubs. We don't have car clubs as such, we have super secret organizations that are harder to get into than the Illuminati. You have to be referred by somebody who's already a member, you cannot just rock up one evening and expect them to accept you into their ranks. That sort of thing will see the windows on your car smashed in. Needless to say, it took me absolutely years to get into the club and even then I'm still not fully accepted in as a member and I've been rolling with them for nearly 5 years. Now, not everyone appreciates a tastefully subbed up motor like me and the others I hang around with. Like my neighbor Karen. I don't blame her, I have a racing spec exhaust, cold air induction kit, straight through, aluminum exhaust sections and a decat which makes the car a rather noisy one, not intentionally, it's a byproduct of wanting to be able to hit 0 to 60 in less than 5 seconds and it is the furthest from being the loudest. There are some guys that have a fat bore exhaust that you can hear coming from the other side of town. I try my best to be polite to my neighbors by not gunning my car when I'm pulling out and driving off but some people are just out for a reason to hate me because I roll around in a modified car and they like to think that I'm some kind of bandido. My neighbor Karen is certainly one of them and she has actually called the cops on me twice so far thinking that I was coming home after having robbed someone on the highway. On both occasions I was coming home from work and was lugging around a huge bag of tools, I do electric cable maintenance so yeah. After that I'm sure Karen thought that she could instigate some sort of vigilante justice as I kept seeing things and stuff kept happening. I would come out of my house in the morning to find my car had been egged and TP'd, I have no way of proving that was Karen at all, but in light of everything that came after, I have no reason to suspect it was anyone else. Obviously, not knowing it was Karen at the time, I figured I was getting targeted by cabbies. They can get very territorial, it's not even funny and not wanting to antagonize them, I cleaned up my car and went about my day. Over the course of about a week or so, I kept finding tags, nails and what can only be described as caltrops all over my driveway. Whoever had put them there was clearly wanting me to shred my tires but luckily I spotted them most of the time. There was one incident where I popped one of my tires driving over a nail which I can only guess had been propped up on my tires so that as soon as I started driving would puncture my wheel. With that operation just under a failure, I would come out to find my tires flat. Worried that someone had slashed my tires, I was lucky in that they only let the air out. I say they, I now know full well it was Karen. And well, I hoped she did not revel in her victory too much because the electric pump I have is just as loud as my exhaust. What really struck me was that sometime later I found stickers plastered all over my windshield, stickers that were the absolute worst to try and peel off. They would instantly tear and leave behind the backing that was next to impossible to get off. I think Karen must have thought that I was taking the piss out of her because I borrowed my father-in-law's jet wash which is much louder than the exhaust of my car. I can imagine it being like Tom and Jerry or something where she enacts some plan to get revenge on me for my loud car only to be faced with contraptions even louder. I find it pretty funny now though at the time I had no idea it was Karen and was just getting flustered and agitated that someone kept vandalizing my car. 
Things started to get worse when Mexico introduced hoy no circular, no driving days. The government pumped out restrictions on when you could and couldn't drive your car based on the last digit of your number plate. Where Saturday and Sunday was a free drive day, which is important. It was all to try and improve air quality, it was then that I came to realize that it was not the taxi drivers that were vandalizing my car, but instead Karen next door. I got back from a cruise with the guys on a Sunday and as soon as I parked up, Karen stormed across her garden and was yelling at me. What do you think you're doing? You're not allowed to drive on Sunday. It's a holy day. She was blurting at me, brandishing a fist. I don't think she understood the restrictions properly and explained to her that there are no restrictions on Sundays. Oh yes there is, it's God's day, a holy day, not a day for you to go around harassing people. I tried to explain to her that I was not harassing anyone and was just driving up and down the beach. I actually found that people were very receptive of our modded motors and would turn a lot of heads and even get people asking to take pictures of the cars when we were parked up, but according to Karen, I was breaking some pretend law. Well, we got into a bit of an argument, I tried my best to stay calm and explain myself, but it's hard when you face someone so desperate to drag you down to their level. I just ended up getting so frustrated with her that I told her if she didn't like it she should just call the cops again. She stormed off back to her house and I thought she really was gonna call the cops but to my absolute horror she comes back out brandishing some really ancient looking shotgun. I pooped myself as she brings it up to bear thinking that she's just gonna shoot me. I must admit I nearly wet myself when I heard the shotgun go off but I was fine. I look up just in time for a second blast of the shotgun and to my horror she had blown out both my tires. After a moment of stunned silence I pull out my phone and call the cops. Now calling the cops is a very risky business in Mexico and the only advice I can give you is make sure you have a decent stack of bills on you just in case they ask for a tip for their service. When the cops finally arrived Karen had retreated back to her home, probably feeling like she had finally won over one on me, but after I talk to the cops and they take my report, then head over to Karen's house very sneaky like tasers out and ready and arrested her. I of course pressed charges for what she did to me and they initially arrested her for illegally carrying a firearm outside of her home. She ended up in prison and I hope she will never mess with anyone again. And yeah, ripe stars, it seems like these unhinged Karens really not only exist in western countries but pretty much everywhere in the world. Either way, if you liked the story, please don't forget to like the video and maybe even post a comment because that would help me tremendously. Thank you so much. And the next one is a revenge story and it is absolutely excellent. It starts like this. I live in a low income apartment complex that is part of a housing organization that owns over 500 units in over 20 complexes and counting in my area. The property managers have been running wild since COVID. The manager of that department is related to three of her direct employees and an awful person. She is a miserable person with serious control issues. She likes to meddle in tenants personal lives and when she doesn't get what she wants will threaten eviction. I'm not entirely sure what I did to get on their bad side but property manager boss who I will refer to as Doucheface has had issues with me for a couple of years. About a year and a half ago I walked out of my apartment to find a tow notice on my car. After doing a little research I found out that the apartment complex was illegally towing vehicles by not giving proper notice. I reached out to a friend in tears and she reached out to some local city officials and I was able to save my car from being towed but this just infuriated Doucheface even more. She made it her goal to invade my personal life for her weird jollies so I got together with some other tenants and officially starting taking steps to begin a tenant union. About 4 months into my efforts I found out that I had very early stage cancer that was able to be treated with surgery. I also had a very traumatic event happen in my home that required biohazard cleanup. Because of these events I had to step back from organizing tenants. I've been told by a former employee that the property manager was happy that I was incapable of continuing my organizing efforts because of my health issues. After I stepped down someone else took on a leadership role and they were able to get community members to come together and start a coup. We rolled into the annual meeting where board elections are held 30 deep. We were able to get myself and a few other tenants elected to the board that night. The board is the organization's director's boss, I am now the doucheface's boss's boss. I just sent off an email to the director chain and co-chair detailing how doucheface is committing fraud. 
And the next one is a malicious compliance story. And by the way guys, let me know, do you prefer revenge stories or malicious compliance stories? I always feel like they are kind of similar, but sometimes I feel like the malicious compliance stories are a little bit less eventful and they often focus on this kind of like job, office environment, which I'm not always a fan of. But let me know what you think. This happened about four years ago. I do construction and we start fairly early. The boss got tired of people walking in at 6.05 or 6.03 when we start at 6. Even though he was a few minutes late more consistently than any of us were, so he said, if you're not standing in front of me at 6 o'clock when we start, then I'm docking 15 minutes from your time for the day. The next day I accidentally forgot my tape measure in my car and had to walk back across the job site to grab it, made it inside at 6. The boss chewed me out and told me he was serious yesterday and docked me 15 minutes. So I took all my tools off right there and sat down on a bucket. He asked why I was not getting to work and I said, I'm not getting paid until 6.15, so I'm not doing any work until 6.15. I enjoy what I do, but I don't do it for free. He tried to argue with me about it until I said, if you're telling me to work without paying me, then that's against the law. You really want to open the company and yourself up to that kind of risk? Maybe I'm the kind to sue, maybe I'm not, but if you keep on telling me to work after you docked my time, then we are gonna find out one way or the other. He shut up pretty quickly after that and everyone else saw me do it and him cave, so now they were not gonna take his crap either. Over the next few days, guys that would have been one or two minutes late just texted the boss, hey, sorry boss, would you have been here at 6.02 and gotten docked, so I will see you at 6.15 and I'll get to work then. And then sat in their cars until 6.15 and came in when their time started. So between people doing what I did or just staying in their cars instead, he lost a ton of productivity and morale because he decided that losing 15 minutes of productivity per person and feeling like a big man was better than losing literally one or two minutes of productivity. Even though everyone stands around BSing and getting material together for the day until about 6.10 anyway. After a few weeks of that he got shoot out by his boss over the loss of productivity and how bad the doc timesheets were looking and reflecting poorly on him as a leader because we were missing deadlines over it and it showed that he doesn't know how to manage people. And then suddenly his little self-implemented policy was gone and we all worked like we were supposed to and caught back up fairly quickly. Worker solidarity for the win. Not one person took his crap and worked that time for free after he tried to swing his weight around on them. But obviously, I was a target after that and only made it two more months before he had stacked up enough BS reasons to get away with firing me when I called in a few days in a row after my mom fell and I took off work to take care of her and monitor her for a while during the day. And the next one is titled, The Neighbor Has to Pay. A while back I bought a bunch of cheap folding chairs from Ikea for my son's birthday party. If anyone is having an event, a barbecue and needs to borrow them, I lend them out. It's no big deal, I just ask that they return them in a timely manner. I lent them out to my neighbor Mark and he was supposed to return them, but then another one of our neighbors, Barb, borrowed them. I was not aware of this until Barb contacted me on Facebook that she had my chairs. I checked with Mark and I'm like, why did you let Barb have my chairs? He told me that Barb said, I said it's cool. I was annoyed so I was just like, bring them back on Saturday after 3 p.m. I get the chairs back now, four of them are completely deformed. My husband tried to fix them but even with trying to undo the bending, the aluminum part didn't go back to the original shape and the plastic part has a big fold crease where it turned white. I checked with Barb about what happened with my chairs and she then said that when she sat on them that some of the crappy ones bent and said that those chairs are dangerous. I was like, we had these for years without any issues. Now FWIW, Barb and her husband are on the bigger side and I guess these chairs are not rated for them or they sat on them weirdly. I was like, look, you didn't even ask me to borrow them, you lied to Mark. Barb is like, oh come on, you let everyone borrow, then it's no big deal, they are just cheap chairs. I was like, okay, for the ones you guys bent, give me $15 each. Barb is like, no, that's messed up, those chairs are super old. Now, plus I should have had chairs that can support fold-bodied adults. I was like, they can handle normal people just fine. She got even more mad and I told her to send the money over. She didn't, but then begrudgingly sent the money over. So, was I wrong here? Like, yes, these are crappy chairs, but you should not break them in the first place. And if you break one, just stop. For me, the money was nice to see back, but it's a principle that I'm not friends with Barb and her husband like I'm with Mike and his wife. Common number one, not the a-hole, you cannot borrow someone's stuff without their permission, break it and expect them not to ask for money for replacements. 
Comment number two, not the a-hole. The age and quality of that chair seemed good enough to Barb and Mark until they broke your property. They owe you replacement value. And yeah, ripe stars, please let me know in the comments what you think about this. Do you think that OP is the a-hole here or not? And I would definitely say that OP is not the a-hole. If I borrow something to someone and they destroy my property, then I also demand the money back. It's just common courtesy to replace these items if you break them. Let me know in the comments if you agree. And the next one is titled Nail Revenge. I am a dry liner, which means I do a lot of moving around for my trade, as most of the work I do is towards the end of most projects. This means that I spend a lot of my time renting flats and houses for only short periods, usually about six months at a time. This has meant that I had to have to deal with a lot of landlords over the years, both good and bad. When it comes to the bad landlords, I will normally just walk away and get on with moving to the next job and take the loss of my deposit and never use them again if I'm working in that area in the future, but this particular landlord got my back up so badly, I was not just going to walk away. I had managed to get myself onto a big job in London working on the new Wembley Stadium, so I decided I would look for a house to rent rather than a flat as I know I was going to be working on it for a while and found a reasonably priced, for London, house to rent from a private landlord in a local newspaper. I gave him a call and meet with him later that day, he seemed okay, went to view the house, paid him the deposit in cash and moved in that weekend. I ended up staying in the house for nearly a year with no problems, always had the rent paid into his bank account on time and fixed any small problems that might crop with the house myself without bothering him up, up to the time when it came to moving out, only ever spoke to him twice on the phone, after there was an issue with the heating that I was unable to fix myself and he sent an engineer around the next day to fix the boiler. Come the time that the job was finishing, I went round to the pawn shop that he owned to give him notice that I would be moving out the following month and to let him know that I was happy for him to come around to inspect the house before I moved out so that I could get my deposit back from him when I returned the keys. He never came round while I was in to inspect the house and so I assumed that he had come round and let himself in while I was at work as I had told him that I had no issue with him doing that if need be. So on the day I moved out, I went around the shop and handed him his keys back and asked for my deposit. His response was, what deposit? The month's rent that I gave you in advance of moving in as a security deposit, I replied. He then told me he was keeping that to cover the cost of repairing damages caused while I was living in the property. I responded, what damages? With the bits of work and decorating I had done on the house, it was in a better state now than when I moved into it. His response was to step forward and get right up into my face and say, you're not getting it back, so F off. And he then gave me a shove which needed me to take three steps back to avoid falling on my butt. Now I am what you would class as average sized and built and this landlord had a good four inches on me height wise and obviously spent some time down the gym and the wise move would be to back away and cut my losses. Now, before I was a builder, I was a member of the British Army in a regiment called the Royal Green Jackets and they had trained us that the best way to proceed when confronted with aggression is to meet it swiftly and with much more violent aggression. So without even thinking about it, I started to move forward with the full intention of dropping this toward quickly and painfully. After the first step though, a thought popped into my head like a bolt from the blue, so I stopped and took a moment to examine the idea from a few different angles, said okay bye to my now ex-landlord and walked out of his shop. What the landlord did not know was that I had a spare backdoor keycard when I had lived in the house which I had stashed in my van in case I ever lost the keys so I could still get back in. So later that evening I let myself back in and decided to stop for one last night before leaving in the morning for my next job which was in Scotland. I spent the last night in the house carefully removing every bit of wood in there. I took down doors, removed skirting boards, banisters, architrave and floorboards being extremely careful not to damage anything. I also completely dismantled all the kitchen units, took up the wood flooring and carpets and I then left everything in nice neat piles in each room. 
I got in my van the next morning and was preparing to start my drive when I decided I wanted to rub a little more salt into my ex-landlord's wounds. So I stopped at his shop on the way out of London, got a spare hammer, screwdriver, bag of nails and box of wood screws out the back of my van and went into the shop. My ex-landlord was not there, probably for the best, so I left the tools with his confused looking assistant and told her to tell her boss, you will be needing these, and left for my drive north. I had my phone switched off while driving and a few hours later while I was having a bite to eat in a service station up by Nottingham, I decided to switch it back on and was greeted by a string of text messages and some very colorful voice messages which left me chuckling to myself. And with this we have reached the end of the video, however if you cannot get enough of my content please check out my endless playlist where you can find thousands of hours of content. In addition please don't forget to subscribe to my channel to not miss any of my daily uploads. Thank you so much in advance and I hope to see you again tomorrow.